Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming on behalf of Merit 25. So I've been asked a question. How do we take our future back? Well, where did we lose our future? I'll tell you when. 1978. How do I know? Because the Sex Pistols told me. Do you remember the Sex Pistols? Do you remember the song, God Save the Queen and Her Fascist Regime? Well, there's a lyric in there which says, there is no future. And I think that they were very prescient in 1978. Because they are about, a year later, Margaret Thatcher came in and stole the whole of Europe's future, not just Britain's future. Now, why is Deutsche Bahn so terrible? I traveled on Deutsche Bahn yesterday and today. It is third world standards. Third world standards. Why do you still have fax machines in your ministries? Why do you have a Germany that is the greatest contradiction in the history of the planet? You have the greatest accumulation of wealth, of surpluses, huh? and the greatest number of people who are worse off today than they were 20 years ago. Now, how is this possible? The world has gone through a process whereby capitalism, after the 1970s, around the time the Sex Pistols were warning us that we lost our future. And what do I mean by that? Well, from the 1820s, from 1820 to 1978, every generation under capitalism, however hard their life was, believed that their children would have a better life. And usually they did. Okay, we went through the Second World War, we went through various catastrophes, but if you look at it generation by generation, every generation of workers and the middle class was better off, a little bit better off than the previous one. From 1820 to 1978 and the Sex Pistols. That's when we lost our future. Today, especially after the catastrophe of the 2008 banking collapse, where Deutsche Bank, Finanzbank, Societe Generale, Ben Peparibas, those four banks, spearheaded the complete bankruptcy of every single European bank, which then led to the bailouts, first of Greece, first of the banks, then of, the, of, of states like Greece and so on, with austerity for the majority of the Greeks, the majority of the Germans, of the French, and so on. Since 2008, this dream that the next generation will be better off, kaput, finito, finished, no future, or a future bleaker than the past, and a society less confident, worse educated, not as well informed, with media that was concentrating more and more and more in the hands of the few that were concentrating the ownership of the means of production, of distribution, of exchange, of trade, of communications. And since then, since 2008, especially, I remember I was here in this city on uh, early 11th of February 2015 to negotiate with the European Central Bank that had just moved into this monster, ugly building of the European Central Bank. Have you seen an uglier building than the ECB? I haven't. Um, it was about then that the European Central Bank started printing trillions of euros, which they gave to the financiers next door, Frankfurt, City of London, hmm? Volkswagen, Siemens. They took the money. They didn't invest it. This is why Volkswagen is now irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant. They produce a lot of cars, but they make no money out of them because they have not invested in technologies. All this money that the European Central Bank printed, that the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of America printed, the Bank of England printed, went into building up house prices, share prices, 
bond prices, not investment, not jobs, not prospects, no future. So you have inequality as a result, and you had something else. The only capitalists who invested money in machinery were the people in Silicon Valley of big tech and the Chinese big tech in Shanghai. Now we have a new form of capital. I call it cloud capital. It's the capital that lives in your phone. It is the capital that lives in your laptop. It is a new form of capital that for the first time doesn't produce anything. It modifies your behavior and mind. And it modifies in the interests of the owners, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, yeah? Alibaba, Tencent, in order to take around 40%, 40%, of international wealth away from workers, even away from capitalists, towards those cloud capitalists, or cloud delists, I call them. Their algorithms not only take our work, take our values, take um, essentially any possibility away from us for communicating with one another without the algorithm poisoning the conversation and causing huge degrees of discontent because those algorithms make a lot of money for their owners when we hate each other, when we can't have a democratic dialogue with, with each other. Think of Twitter. Yeah, it's as somebody's put it, it's like every, every tweet, if you put it next to one another, it's a bit like collecting the graffiti from inside men's toilets in pubs and bars. It's just ugliness, hatred, poison. That is what's happening to our public debates while politicians are in another universe. Germany is in deindustrializing, and there is not a single political party in Germany discussing it. Not a single. Everybody is trying to do that which the Greek bourgeoisie was doing in 2010. 2010, we, the Greeks, were bankrupt, and our rulers tried to do one thing: to make sure that, that nothing changes. Similarly, with your political class, from the Linke all the way to the AfD. Everybody is trying to think of how we're going to subsidize the conglomerates, the electricity markets. Nobody is discussing what is the next step. How do we move away from a failed model, the new model for Germany, the new model for Europe, the new model for the world? So, how do we take our future back? Well, there is an old idea, which is extremely radical, and that is why it's so hated. That is why they are trying to do their best to destroy it. It's called democracy. But not the democracy that these people are talking about, who claim that you know, whatever they do, they do it for democracy. You know, they continue the war in Ukraine forever for democracy. They are massacring Palestinians for democracy. They are destroying the planet for democracy or democratically. No, democracy meant one thing in ancient Athens, rule by the poor. That's how Aristotle, who didn't like democracy, by the way, that's how he designed, he de defined it. Democracy is a system where the poor govern. Because by definition, the poor are in the majority. Our democracy was designed so the majority is never in power. That was the whole point of the Constitution of the United States of America, which then we inherited here in Europe, because the American Constitution was the first liberal democratic constitution. If you read the memoirs of those who wrote it, who wrote the American Constitution, it's clear. One concern they had was how to stop the people from governing through representation, through elections. So our elections are there to legitimize us not having democracy. So how do I take our future back? By putting the demos back into democracy. And this is what we're trying to do with Melon 25. Thank you so much for being here. We haven't filled too soon, as you might say. It's not going to be easy, but let's have a go. We'll probably fail, okay? We'll probably fail. I give it a very high probability. But so what? 
I don't know about you, but I know that I'm going to die. I don't believe in the afterlife. I'm an atheist. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to enjoy every day that I live. Similarly, we will keep fighting every day we live because it's the only way of having a good life and reclaiming the future. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks um, to Yanis for your distribution here and uh, so on. Now we come to the second guest tonight. Um, I will tell something about Helge Poikart. Helge Poikart. <laughs> yeah, I will tell something about you, Helge. A little things. Is it okay? All right. <clears throat> yeah, he, I mean, I can say a lot, but uh, I will do it shortly. He received a degree in sociology in 1983 and economist in um, 1986. He was awarded a doctor in political uh, science and economics in 1991. And doctorate in philosophy in 1994. In 1996, he was appointed professor of economics at the University of uh, Latvia, where he remained until June 97. He was also a private lecturer in the university here in Frankfurt. Uh, from April uh, 2003, Poikert was a university lecturer at the University of um, Erfurt. He'd been professor on the University of Siegen since 2006. And his focus is on the history of economic thoughts, economic history, heterodox theory, formation, fundamental ecological, uh, ecology, and financial markets, as well as post-autistic economic, plurale economic, <laughs> uh, real-world economics. He works as, um, as an author for the Gabler Economic Lexicon, Poikert is a member of the advisory board of ATTAC Germany and a founding member of the Science for Socioeconomic Education and Science. Poikert is a signatory of an open letter in support of the demands of Sciences Rebellion, an offshot uh, for scientists um, of Extinction Rebellion, compatible to science for future. Yeah, uh, I would now ask Helge Poika to explain his ideas and thoughts on this question as well. Please, Helge. You, you didn't leave out anything. Thanks for that. The ten minutes already almost over. Uh, yes, uh, nice to see you. Hello, Fox. Um, uh, the Mira program um, addresses the, the topic of the ecological threats, and I will, I will concentrate on this. Now, if we have a look at the last uh, IPCC report, uh, uh, when you have a look at the, at the objective data, uh, then you see that we have a, a remaining emissions budget of zero. So it's not uh, 1,000 megatons or so. No, it's, it's, it's zero. If you don't believe it, uh, I have the chart here. Yes, yeah? So come to me later on. Uh, I show you. Um, and now this has a consequence. And the consequence is that our way of life, that everything is questioned. Uh, that's, that's the main, the main uh, uh, problem. Uh, our, our usual uh, uh, way of living, our civilization, the basics of economy and society, they don't hold even more. Now, usually, uh, uh, an active uh, person w would uh, deal with these things, but uh, unfortunately, many humans have the human genome, and then uh, they react in a different way. Uh, we, there is uncertainty, and then they react with fear, denial, roll back. And that's why we have these conservative, rightist, uh, fascist, uh, uh, anti-migration uh, movements. Uh, it's an expression of this basic uh, fear. And even the German Council of Environmental Experts, uh, this is a public and official uh, institution, uh, even they say uh, uh, that uh, uh, on Carnival, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the emissions budget uh, was over, you know, but last year in 2022. When you check their documents, then you can see this. And then you are surprised. Well, why does the government uh, don't talk about this? So we have a zero 
a zero uh, emission budget, but in fact, in Germany, uh, last year we had seven, 750 million tons emissions. And that, uh, that's the difference. Now, uh, uh, when we have a look at the Paris agreements, you know uh, that the targets are low, and even these low targets uh, are failed. And we are approaching uh, at least three uh, degrees uh, global warming, and this means for Germany uh, it can end up with uh, six degrees, and that's a lot. And then we have not even spoken about the planetary boundaries, and uh, as you may have read, six out of nine uh, have already uh, been crossed. And we did not talk about the probable tipping points, and we did not talk about the 1050 rule, which says that 10% uh, of the world population consume 50% of the resources, and 50% use 10% of the resources. So we have here a, a north-south uh, divergence, and all this is really a problem. Now we can ask how does uh, the German government and the EU, for example, and the international institutions, how do they uh, deal with this? And they have a wonderful uh, fairy tale, and this is eco-modernism. And what is this? On the one hand, they say, and they have wonderful charts for this, and it's hard to believe that the emissions go down to zero, but growth, sorry, but uh, growth can continue forever, you know? So indefinite growth. So that's the story. And in my view, that is a defense mechanism, a den denial mechanism. And that's why Mera uh, 25 addresses uh, this uh, subject. Uh, um, uh, uh, and that's a positive thing. Um, another thing, and I, I don't want to make advertisement here, you know, um, but in fact it is a little bit. Um, uh, they, they discuss the, the capitalist uh, regulation uh, regime and make it a topic, and that is correct. Why? Um, when you ask, why are these denial mechanisms, why don't they face the problems, uh, we have to uh, be aware that we are living in a competitive and profit economy. So, growth, cost externalization, land grabbing, expansion, uh, constant expansion and also innovations, but with new rebound effects, uh, which we don't foresee, uh, uh, is a fact. So that's the system inherent uh, growth dynamics. And on the other hand, uh, we have a limited state, a very limited state. We have a structural dependency. It's not only that these people uh, are sausages, you know, Würstchen, uh, or that this is a Linda with, with the wrong ideology, uh, or... Uh, <laughs> that they are, uh, I, I, I don't know, um, blockheads or so, uh, or, or, or boring, you know, <laughs> like a chancellor or so. No, um, it's a structural uh, dependency because we have a tax and competitive state and so there is necessarily a joint, um, a joint purpose alliance of politics with the holders of economic and financial power. So it's independent of these, Marxists would say, character masks, you know. And... Um, so that's the, uh, the uprise of the problem. And the German Federal uh, Environment Agency, the Umweltbundesamt, uh, and now I quote, I quote, because maybe you didn't believe it, a global per capita emission of less than one ton of CO2 would be climate compatible, which would require a reduction of around 95% compared to today's level, which is 11.5 tons. Pooh. So now you ask, and I'm a little bit ill, that... Oh, I, I drink a little bit. <laughs> and now the now the proposals. Now the proposals. So many branches must shrink by well over fifty percent, if not seventy percent. So we need deindustrialization. Maybe some of uh, Mera uh, have, have a different opinion, but in my view, it's impossible uh, to reach uh, uh, acceptable uh, targets when we don't shrink massively the fossil cement energy deforestation companies, the automo automobile, chemical, fertilizer, airlines, metal, and financial sector, point, point, point. How's this translate? Um, uh, so these, these companies and sectors must shrink dramatically. And uh, how can this be? We need an orderly radical conversion, and we need uh, German, or people who live in Germany, German skilled employees. We need around uh, 500,000 uh, persons per year for, as doctor, nurses, IT, research, bus and train drivers, pharmaceuticals, etc. And I think it's not okay when we take the employees, the uh, competent employees of developing countries because they should be there. 
Otherwise, people are starving there because we say, thank you, give us your good people, uh, and you can stay alone, you know? That's no, that's no policy, in my view. Uh, uh, that's leapfrogging uh, uh, in, in a very bad manner. So, 500,000 persons uh, per year are required, so we need a great conversion. And now, how, how can this be? How can this be financed? Because there will be a great of stress, you know? Um, and in my view, uh, and, and this is hinted at uh, uh, more or less indirectly in the, in the MIRA program uh, uh, by, by, the, by central banks, not this <laughs> central banks against which we uh, protested, uh, Blockupy, etc., uh, uh, but a reformed uh, a central bank, and we would need gift money. Now, gift money, what does it mean? Not, don't take the German word. Uh, uh, it means uh, Schenkgeld. And this means that the central bank uh, should put money on the table uh, of uh, public uh, bodies and then they can spend it. They don't have to pay interest and they don't have to pay uh, back the money. So it's free of charge. Why not? Uh, then usually the inflation argument comes and uh, this can be counted. Okay, so we need, we need free money, um, uh, uh, gift money uh, by the central banks to finance this because today... Uh, it is argued we first need uh, a growing economy to have taxes, and then we can, sm can, uh, can spend money to prevent the consequences of this growth, you know? And this is the, the cat, you know, the, the cat. And um, so that doesn't work. And we need uh, a conditional basic income, in my view, a conditional one. Uh, so the public sector uh, has to um, establish... Um, uh, uh, working conditions in the sectors uh, I mentioned, and, and there must be a living income. And, and this can be financed via this uh, gift money. Uh, in addition, we need... It's okay? <laughs> um, so, uh, we need an emergency plan, for example, the emission trading system. We need steep and predictable increases, up to 300 tons. That's a lot. That's a lot, I know. Uh, the maximum income should be, as far as I see it, 10 times the, the minimum wage. Um, we need a, a radical tax reform. Uh, my, my understanding is maybe a little bit more radical than uh, Mera. 75% uh, seven, on resources and emissions. 75%. Today it's on labor. Uh, uh, and and that's, uh, that's really uh, an unfortunate uh, uh, con uh, constellation. Um, we need new forms of, of ownership. Because when we don't have growth and compensatory uh, consumption, uh, then people must be happy uh, uh, at the workplace, you know? It's easy as that. And um, we, maybe we need only 20 or 30, uh, I think maybe 20 uh, hours of formal work in the, in, in, in the formal sector. And then we have an informal sector with care, repair, and so-called own work, Eigenarbeit. Um, and maybe even... We need a CO2 tax for over one, to, uh, one or two tons per person per year. And if a person consumes more, and this is not transferable, you know, poor rich, <laughs> um, uh, if, if, if people consume more, 5% uh, of their personal annual income uh, per ton should be cashed in. That's, that's uh, an idea. I have many more proposals, just uh, three or four. I wanted also uh, to talk uh, about the financial sector, but I think uh, that's unfair because the ten, mi ten minutes are over and maybe this can be a topic. Uh, yeah, why not, of our debate. Uh, so uh, just uh, some two or three uh, further uh, proposals. In the primary sector, uh, an end of factory farming for sure. We have to prohibit environmentally harmful fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, the EU Commission has uh, exactly done the opposite uh, two weeks ago. Uh, maybe we even uh, need consumption uh, uh, to, to ration consumption via ration cards because the prices with these high uh, CO2 in, uh, uh, um, uh, certificate increases, they will be very expensive, you know, and no pesticides, etc. Maybe no Harbour Bosch, etc. Then they will be very expensive. And then maybe we even need rationing. I don't like rationing, and I know that there were some uh, countries where rationing uh, uh, occurred, and people have not been very happy. <laughs> I know it. Mm. So a frantic standstill uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a fact today, and many wheels uh, stand still, and they should so, do so. Uh, so uh, bus and uh, trains should be free, free of charge, uh, and in my view, 70% of the cars, uh, of private cars, have simply to disappear, yes? Uh, otherwise, it, will, it won't work. 
In intermediate time, private petrol and diesel consumption uh, could be 500 liters per person and per year. Ooh, that's bad. Um, no more cruise ships and low-cost airlines, and even a closure of most, uh, uh, especially the, the smaller um, uh, um, uh, airports. And sure, ban all uh, disposal products, including cups, foil, and bottles. So I have 20 more proposals here, or 30, uh, but time runs out, and um, yes, and um, I, I skip, I skip, I skip the, uh, the financial part. Uh, may, maybe maybe uh, you can ask this question later, Dada, and then I can uh, talk a little bit about it. Thanks. Many thanks um, to Helge for his contribution to our question, how we can get our future back. Now I would like to invite um, Janis and Helge to take a seat here. I prepare some questions, or we prepare some questions for you. Please. There are all these mobile phones on tables. <laughs> well, uh, we are quite good in time. Thanks a lot for this short introducing. And um, yeah, we'll start now. I get some questions for both of you in a different ways. Um, I start now because I think you need a little rest, Helga. I start with Janis. And I want to um, ask him, like, um, we are since 2019 now in the um, last EU election. What was happen until now? Well, we lost last June. We had won nine seats in Greece in uh, um, July of 2019, and um, we lost them. And the fascists replaced us in parliament. That's the long and the short of it. And the reason, I mean, the my reason, you may have a different reason. We, I think we did a very good job in Parliament. We were wild, widely recognized as having done a very good job in Parliament. But you know what? The left gets one opportunity in 20, 30 years because Let's face it, we live in societies where mm, the majority of working people, of the petty bourgeoisie, they fear. They fear change. You know, the system, the media, uh, drum into them the fear and the belief in Tina that there is no alternative to the system. So the left, if we manage once every 20, 30 years to excite people, we're doing well. And we need to take advantage of that moment of radicalization. 2015, the people trusted us. They set aside their fear. They went against the European Central Bank, Schäuble, Merkel, the Greek oligarchy, the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, the American government. Huh? And they gave us a mandate. And then they gave us the mandate again in the referendum. And we betrayed them. Doesn't matter what I did and Cyprus did and, you know, that doesn't matter. A taxi driver put it to me beautifully recently. Uh, just after the election, he said, I agree with everything you say, but I didn't vote, you, vote for you. I said, why not? He said, well, you know what? I can't forgive you. I said, what did I do? He said, you didn't do anything. I said, so why... Can't you forgive me? He said, because you gave me hope. And then you took it away. You failed. So, but you know, comrades, there's no final victory and there's no final defeat. And we have to keep going because capitalism, what I call now techno feudalism, is constantly creating one crisis after the other. Soon there will be no planet on which we can live and reproduce ourselves. Right? We're like stupid astronauts or cosmonauts poisoning the air in the spaceship in which we travel. So we need to keep 
keep struggling. That's why I said before that you know we may not win, but we have to keep fighting. Somehow, somehow we'll keep fighting. Um, maybe another question for Helge. Um, in your few, in uh, your few, uh, what would have to happen to implement the Mera 25 proposals? The focus you already um, told us, explain us, is uh, harmonizing resources, avoiding overproduction, very important point, preventing growing constructions, eliminating social and climate environment disasters, and ending wars, um, doesn't matter which ones. Um, what other points um, can you uh, cite for the radical ecological turnouts? Oh, yeah, that's a brief question. Um, in my view, what we need um, is education of the, of the people. <laughs> um, and and I think, uh, uh, I, I'm very ecologically oriented in the last years, uh, that the ecological crisis may open the eyes to many people that this uh, capitalist system uh, can't uh, endure for, for, forever. And then we need a, a re-empowerment of the state. And as, as I mentioned, um, uh, the, the, the state or public organs are in, in chain uh, today. In chain, so why? Uh, uh, be, because uh, private banks create money, uh, and it's 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 not it's not the central bank and uh, which gives free money uh, uh, um, or gift money uh, to to the to the public uh, uh, bodies, and and then they can they can spend it for reasonable uh, things, and um, so so yes, uh, I believe maybe in the um, positive effect of uh, negative effects of climate change, which is uh, not a very good statement, I know. Uh, and, and, and then maybe we change the basic uh, uh, structure of, of financing uh, and also, uh, and also uh, a domestication of the financial sectors. And uh, I have some proposals, but I'll tell you later. Oh, um, <clears throat> so on, um, yeah, anyway. Capitalism, um, now another question for Yanis. Um, I don't want to disturb, actually. I just leave all these answers like they are. Uh, we can discuss maybe later on on the table and get a little talk. But um, Yanis, I, I, I'm thinking that capitalism is on the end somehow. But um, the free market has looking since the collapse itself from the real economy States are entering into crisis, you already told, uh, compensations and um, cuts are being made in social areas and uh, digitalization is overtaking international society, you already also talked. Where are these phenomena landing and what steps must be taken to prevent a devastating catastrophe? The problem is not digitalization. I love digital devices, I love science, I love technology. That is not a problem. The problem is that we have a new form of technology, of technological capital. It's not a technology, it's the capital that is based on digital technologies, which can change the way we answer the question, the infamous and beautiful question that Vladimir Ilyich Lenin asked. He, descri he described politics as the answer to the question, who does what to whom? Who has the power to make you do things? Now we have a new form of capital. This is something we really must take very seriously. Because, you see, for the first time, the first time in the history of capitalism, we have machines in a dialectical relationship with us, machines that we train to train us, to train them, to train us, to train them, to train us, to train them, to put ideas into our minds, ideas of what we want to believe and ideas of what we want to buy. And once we get these ideas, they sell them to us directly bypassing any capitalist market. Amazon.com is not a market. It's the digital fiefdom. 
belonging to one man who charges 40%. The vassal capitalist who are selling the stuff, that the same algorithm, the same algorithm, think about it, the same algorithm that belongs to Jeff Bezos is trained by us to tell us what we want, sells it to us, and drives the proletarian labor inside the Amazon warehouse that delivers it to us. You know, they have this device on their, on, their, on their hand, which actually drives them like Charlie Chaplin's modern times. So that is, you know, that is the future. You see, people say to me, what will artificial intelligence do to us? Stupid question. The question is, what has it already done to us? This is already reality today. It's not what AI will do, right? So, social democracy is dead. The old social democratic ways of redistributing income and wealth and all that, gone. Think of, let's take a, a very simple example, right? As we speak, AI programs, you can see one up there, right? Can double the productivity of the labor force of, you take a company that has 100 workers. You buy one of those, these bits of AI, and suddenly you can do the same work, you can have the same output with 50, that 50 workers can produce, okay? Now, there is no tax system, there is no labor market protection program that can prevent that capitalist from firing 50 of the 100 workers. But imagine a different system where that company belonged to the 100 workers who would want to take this AI machine in order for them to work half the time. Imagine the beautiful effect on society if these people can produce the same outcome and half of the time look after the elderly, their children, the community, read poetry, play music. That is prosperity. So we should never turn against the, what I call cloud capital, but we should aim at the old Marxist idea of grabbing the ownership of the means of production, not just of production, not just of distribution, not just of exchange, but also of computation, the digital devices. So let's socialize Google and Amazon.com and all these AI-driven applications which are going to deny our future. And also regarding climate change, people say to me that, Janis, come on, the planet that is dying, why do we care about AI? Well, because our public debates take place through AI now, through TikTok, through Instagram, through Facebook. Huh? And these algorithms, when they belong to the very, very, very few, they are designed to make us hate each other and not to have a conversation. And if we don't have the conversation, we cannot organize politically, democracy is finished, we cannot do anything about climate change. You want to say yes, something I, about that? Uh, usually I like to disagree, but in this case it's hard to do. Uh, uh, no, I totally agree with you. And, uh, and the... Pr like this? Oh, okay. And, um, and the problem is that Instagram, TikTok, etc. Uh, at the beginning I thought uh, that's exaggerated, but uh, unfortunately it seems not to be. Uh, that it undermines democracy, that hate, etc. Is, 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 is the, uh, the result, and uh, uh, infanti inf infantilization, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's very dangerous, uh, uh, even for a formal, uh, for formal democracy. Uh, and manipulation uh, is overwhelming. Uh, when you take chat GPT, at the moment it's more or less neutral, but it's in private hands. And now uh, a person like uh, Elon Musk, uh, one, one day uh, uh, persons like him who are writers, they will influence the content of things like ChatGPT. For example, uh, to introduce uh, some recommendations or so. And uh, it's, it's hard to check the, this. Uh, and I, I cannot see that the European Commission uh, or, or anybody else 
uh, is really aware uh, or willing uh, um, to, uh, uh, to, to tackle this, uh, this problem. And so far, uh, I agree with you, this has to be taken out of the, uh, the hands of uh, private entrepreneurs. Mm. <laughs> Um, Helga, you, you was invited here, it's actually an Amira um, event here, uh, but still I would like to know um, how is your, or which points of Meta 25 program you, uh, you record differently or give a different weighting? Uh, yes, I will mention a point and I'm sure that many uh, attendants here will not like this. Uh, uh, the point is on migration. Um, I, I see a real problem when you say we accept political and economic uh, migration. Uh, we try to uh, have checkpoints in the countries uh, where people apply. And, in, so you, and then uh, people have a basic income and a basic pension here. Uh, I think uh, that is absolutely not possible. Now, you can ask, uh, well, what's your proposal? Do you say uh, they should leave where they are? They are responsible for their own mess? No, I don't say that. In my view, the only uh, reasonable uh, policy, and as an abstract principle, that's easy to say, I know. But the only way to deal adequately with these problems is uh, uh, to, to make sure that there are conditions in these countries that people uh, can and like to stay. That's the only possibility. Uh, and, and, and this influences the EU uh, uh, foreign policy, for example, trade policy uh, 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 in, uh, in Somalia. Uh, they, they uh, there are no more fishes because you have the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the EU. Uh, they bought rights to fish there, also in Northern Africa, etc. And then it's no surprise that people say, well, we follow the fish, you know. Uh, uh, so that's very normal. So I would, uh, uh, I would deal with this problem uh, a little bit uh, uh, differently. Oh. Hmm? Yes, I say, uh, as I said, we should support these, uh, these countries that people uh, uh, can, can stay there. Otherwise, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't work. And um, this is an abstract principle now. Uh, but to open the borders uh, uh, is, in my view, uh, is, 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 is very, very difficult because there will be, uh, uh, not least due to climate change, there will be hundreds of millions uh, uh, who should have the right to migrate. Mm, and, and, and that's a problem, in my view. Yanis, what's your point? Look, I see you, I, see, I, I, I recognize your concern, especially if we have a basic income, which is a good one, that will act as a magnet for you know, millions of people who are already being magnetized anyway, uh, even without the basic income. But, okay. we are in the country of Immanuel Kant, who taught us one thing. We have no right, and it is not rational, to treat people as a means to an end. Thirty-two thousand people have died. We kill them. We Europeans kill them because we have created a big, ugly wall around the European Union, uh, which essentially, consciously or subconsciously, increasingly consciously drowns people in the Mediterranean Sea, especially in the Aegean Sea, as a means to keep the rest out. Europe is a criminal continent for the reasons that you are putting forward for that logic. It's not an abstract concept. We now have Frontex, as we speak, in my country. As we speak, there are 25 instances every 24-hour period, 20, every day, of pushing back boats, back to Turkey, back to Lebanon, and people are drowning. This is the human cost of keeping them out as you say we should. 
my view and the view of Mary 25 is let them in because it is the right thing to do. <laughs> let me also speak to your proposal that we should do our best to help them stay there. I don't disagree with you on this. You know what would help? To remove the colonial extractive industries in Africa, in Asia, that are destroying their lives. <laughs> However, it is an irrefutable empirical fact that even if their living standards start rising, the number of migrants who will come to Europe will also rise. Because what we forget is that the ones who manage to get here, to, the ones who manage to drown are the ones who have 10,000 euros, 5,000 euros, 8,000 euros with which they paid uh, those bastards. Even more, 25,000 euros. Huh? Even more. Even more. So the high, you know, there's going to be this kind of a curve. So you increase the average income in Africa or in, Asia or in Afghanistan, right? You increase the average income, if you do, if you manage to do what you are saying, and the number of migrants will increase. They will not decrease for a long while. And only once they reach a certain level of development, equivalent to China's per capita, then they don't want to migrate anymore. So this idea that we, and in any case, the concept which is often misrepresented as a Marxist one, that the foreigner comes in and that reduces the bargaining power of the proletariat at home. And sometimes this is ascribed to Marx. This is bad science and bad Marxism. Usually what happens, because I have been, as you probably know, I've been engaged in these debates for decades. Uh, there was this letter that you may remember that Marx wrote to comrades in New York regarding Irish migrants. And in that letter, he, which is often quoted by those who are, a, from a left-wing point of view, against migration, in which he says that the Irish migrants into New York, and New Jersey in particular, were being used by the American capitalists in order to depress wages in New Jersey and in New York. That's the first part of the letter. This is usually what is being quoted. The second part is not quoted. In which Marx himself says, yeah, but the solution to this is not to keep them out. The solution is to organize them in the trades unions together with the local, uh, with the local workers. That must be our objectives and have make no mistake people do not want to leave their homes and make no mistake there is no distinction between political and economic migrants i do not care whether somebody took their kid and put them in a boat at the risk of drowning together with their kid because they had a gun to the head or because the kid was starving and couldn't have milk and couldn't have anything to eat for me, it's one and the same thing. It's terrorism. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> um, now, what the many migrations, and uh, we have to talk now about all these wars, but um, you know, when it's, uh, the treat of a war and the plight of the Palestina is a key element of your uh, campaign at the moment. Um, why did you choose these topics? <clears throat> the pa <laughs> no, no, not a piece. Um, the, the Palestine and, uh, are a, a key of your elements now in your campaign. Why you are choose this? The Palestinians and war Palestinians and... Uh... Well, you know, if I were living in 1943, I would have chosen the Holocaust as the number one issue that didn't allow me to sleep at night. Today, there's a genocide happening in Gaza and in the West Bank. That keeps me awake. 
<laughs> Ten years ago, it was the massacre and the famine in Yemen that kept me awake. Uh, on the 24th of February of 2022, when Putin ordered his troops into Ukraine, that kept me awake. War, massacre, genocide, holocaust keeps me awake. I think that we should all we should all be kept awake by that, and it should be the number one priority of any political program. You know, peace and the end of wars, which result in only in losers. There are no winners in these wars, especially when you've got a European Union which is complicit in these massacres. Um, <laughs> Let's look at Ukraine first and then Palestine, because these are the two big ones happening now. They are not the only ones. There is Kashmir, there is Yemen, there, there is Myanmar. There are lots and lots of atrocities taking place with our complicity. But Ukraine and Palestine are our backyard and our responsibility. There is no doubt that Putin is a complete bastard and a criminal. There's no doubt about that. In, I knew that in 2001 when he killed 250,000 Chechens just for the hell of it. He killed 250,000 Chechens in order to solidify his presidency in the Kremlin. This is the kind of criminal we're talking about, right? But when he invades, uh, I'm not going to go into the question of whether he was provoked or not. He was certainly provoked, but that doesn't absolve him. That doesn't make him that he's right because he was provoked by the United States, which always wanted a war on the back, on the, in the backyard of the, of the European Union. He get, gets in. Our party, Mayor 25, immediately, on the day after that, we came out with our intervention. We said, this war must end now. Putin is a criminal, uh, but we must prevent a never-ending war. Because this war is going to turn into a new Afghanistan, a combination of Afghanistan and the First World War in our backyard. And the only way to safeguard the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine is for the West to go to Putin and cut a deal. And the deal that we were proposing was really very simple. Troops go back to where they were before the 24th of February 2022 in exchange for a commitment by the West that Ukraine will not enter NATO, along the lines of Austria. In the same way, Austria during the Cold War was not a member of NATO, but it was a liberal democracy. Uh, and the Donbass area should be ruled al along the lines of something like the Good Friday Agreement that resolved the Northern Irish. Okay. Instead of that, what you have is you have Ursula von der Leyen and Stoltenberg, two unelected idiots, fools, receiving word directly from Washington, D.C., and dragging Euro the European Union into a permanent, never-ending war, which is going to kill hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and destroy any possibility of a prosperous Ukraine within a functioning European Union. Uh, who wins from this per perpetual war? in Ukraine. Putin, the moment that war ends, Putin is finished. He will be overthrown from within. He will not be overthrown as long as this war continues. Like Netanyahu. Netanyahu, the moment there is an end to the massacre in Gaza and the kind of calm, not peace, calm, Netanyahu will be overthrown. So these people, Putin and Netanyahu, want a never-ending massacre. That's what they want. Zelensky too. Because Zelensky will be finished. The moment there's peace in Ukraine, he's out. Um, who else benefits? Texan and New Mexican fracking oil and natural gas companies, because they are providing now all the natural gas in Europe that Gazprom is not providing. Who else? The arms industry, the weapon manufacturers. These are the only winners. Everybody else is a loser, especially the European Union, especially, of course, especially the Ukrainians. When it comes to Palestine, look, folks, it's comrades, friends, you know, Europeans, Germans, Greeks, whoever, whatever you are in this room. I'd never 
agreed, with, well, on the 7th of October, I happened to be in, in Berlin and I was being interviewed. And I was asked to, you know, whether I condemned Hamas, and I said no. But I also added, <laughs> I condemn every single, every single piece of violence against a civilian. I don't care who has done it, whether it is Israel, Hamas, me, you, yeah? any act of violence against a civilian, I condemn. I do not condemn Hamas. And then I added, I do not even condemn the settlers, the Israeli settlers, or even Netanyahu. I condemn us Europeans. We created this massacre there. Only we, Europeans, centuries of anti-Semitism, centuries of pogroms of the Jewish people here in Europe, not in Africa, huh? not in Jerusalem. Jews and Arabs were living side by side in perfect harmony until we, Europeans, put our finger into it. So we had pogroms in Ukraine, we had pogroms in Poland, we had pogroms in Greece of the Jews, in Ioannina, in Thessaloniki, we had pogroms in, of course, Spain, right? We forgot the South Europe. Yeah, we had pogroms everywhere, right? And those pogroms led to the Holocaust. And you know, I know that you're Germans and you feel that you're responsible for the Holocaust. You are responsible for the Holocaust, but so are we. Because it wasn't just the German Nazis. It was the Greek Nazis, the Croat Nazis, the Serb Nazis, the French Nazis, the Lithuanian Nazis, the Estonian Nazis, the Russian Nazis, the Ukrainian Nazis. There were plenty of Nazis in Europe in the 1940s who were not, who were not German. Remember, we are responsible for that, right? And then we are responsible for the perpetuation of those atrocities by supporting Zionism. Now, what is Zionism? One expression, the main slogan of Zionism from the late 19th century to this day is a land without a people, for a people without a land. A land without a people. Now, who will use this first? This is a rhetorical question, I'll answer it, the British. The British used this expression first in 1778 in Australia. When they disembarked in Australia, the British looked at five and a half million Aborigines and said, you're not humans. This is a land without people for us. In other words, you are not human. This is the dehumanization process that begins the massacre, the genocide. And the result is that five and a half million Aborigines then, 120,000 today. Right? A land without a people. That is a slogan of white supremacist settlement. That's Zionism. And we in Europe are politicians across Europe. Effectively, we condoned the idea that the Palestinians will be deemed non-human. Palestine is a land without a people for a people without a land. The project, the Zionist project from 1948, the Nakba, was a project not of colonialism. Because when the British went to India, they didn't want to replace the local population. They wanted to take over the factories, the ports, the assets, the trade, and they sent managers, huh? the British Empire managers. It was in Australia that they wanted to eliminate the people to take the land, the British. India and Australia are not the same thing. Similarly, they did the same thing to South Africa and Kenya. White Settlement colonialism, not the same thing as pure colonialism. Eh? And it is this model that is being practiced in Palestine. From 1948, the Zionist project is a project not of colonization, of elimination of the Palestinian people and keeping some of them in order to treat them as in the same way that the Boers in South Africa wanted to have some blacks working for them in their houses, in their mines, in their factories, but not in their cities. They wanted to have them elsewhere around walls in Bantu stands. That's Israeli apartheid today. And that has been happening from 1948. 
So in, on the 7th of October of, nine, of 2023, I refused to condemn the attack against Israel because what do people do when you, you put them in a prison camp, you surround them, you starve them until the slow genocide is accomplished. They rebel. And some of these rebels are going to be inhuman. I condemn the inhumanity. I salute the rebellion. Any people who rebel against apartheid deserve our support. And in any case, in any case, you know our friend Iris Hefetz from Berlin. Huh? She was arrested in Berlin. She's an Israeli Jew some months ago. She went out of her street with a placard she had written on it as an Israeli and as a Jew, stop the killing in Gaza. And she was arrested by a white German policeman for anti-Semitism. Unless the Palestinians are freed, we are not going to be free in this country, in my country, in Europe. <laughs> Have you said that? I need to make clear our MERA 25 policy on this. The moment, any moment, a Jewish person, a Jewish person feels threatened just because he or she is Jewish, we are going to wear the Star of David here in support. Similarly, the moment the Palestinian is threatened, we will wear the kefiyah like Dusan is wearing. I don't care personally what kind of state or states or statelets we have between the sea and the river. I don't care. What I care is we have universal human rights and political liberties between these two bodies of water, because I believe in Germany, you're not allowed to say from the river to the sea. And this is our policy. And unless we stop being complicit in this crime against humanity, as Europeans, we shall never be free. Because our regime, which is so complicit in the massacres in Ukraine, in Palestine, in Israel, and elsewhere, looks at the majority of you in the same way that they look at the Palestinians. They have no interest in their well-being. Um, <laughs> um. I will not uh, comment what I told you on it. Uh, and it was hard to, uh, not easy to understand uh, here. Uh, as far as I understood you, you, you called it genocide, right? What's going on there at the moment? Not me. It is genocide. Uh, yes. And in my view, uh, as a German um, who feels in a certain sense uh, responsible uh, for the Sho Shoah, uh, there should be made differences. Uh, a genocide is when you try to eradicate and to kill 100% and completely no, a people. No, that is not so. that is not I, I thought that, that's, that's the definition of genocide. No, that's not the definition. So that's what? the definition of Holocaust. Well, let, let me see if we can agree on something. What is the genocide? Well, let, let, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Well, there's a formal definition in the United Nations. It's a legal definition. It's not a question of opinion. But let, let, me, let me see if we can agree, because it's important that you and I should agree on this, like everybody else should agree on this, right? So that we can have a united front amongst progressives. Look, I agree with you that the Holocaust, the Torah, was the, it was a unique evil. It's, this is not what's happening now in Palestine. It's not what happened by the French in Algeria. And I agree with you that the Holocaust was unique because the Nazis wanted to kill 100% of the Jews. They were like stamp collectors. You know, a stamp collector wants to have the whole collection, and if there is one missing, they can't sleep at night. That's where the Nazis were the Jews. Mm -hmm. The Israelis are not like that. The French were not like that. Eh? The Turks were not like that with the Armenians. 
They didn't want to kill everyone. They wanted to kill enough of them to eradicate them from that part of the land for them to shift out. That's what they wanted. So genocide the, differs from the Holocaust. There was only one Holocaust in the history of the world, and hopefully there won't be another one. And the Jews were the victims, and we're all responsible for it, as I said before. Okay? But... Now, what's the definition? What's well, the, definition? The, genocide, the definition of genocide is systematic killing, reduction, um, withdrawal of basic goods for life, like water, like electricity, like electricity today. Back then it was, I don't know what, bread or wheat. Hmm? For the purposes of killing a large percentage of an ethnic group, so as to push them out of their native land. So the Armenians, we talk about an Armenian genocide, don't we? It's, it's already been passed in the United most, Nations. Most of them were killed, yes. No, 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 they were not. That is not true. 30% were killed. It was a genocide. It was a genocide because it succeeded. They had to shift up to the Caucasus, they came to Greece, they, they went to Canada, they went to Germany, right? And it was systematic. So according to the United Nations, it doesn't matter what you and I think, the massive systematic massacre of the Armenians, which of course did not kill all of them, because now there is a country called Armenia, and their descendants are there. Uh, and the Turks didn't want to follow them up. The, 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 the Turkish regime that killed them, massacred them, genocided them, didn't mind them moving on. So they were not like the Nazis. Uh, they wanted simply to, to do ethnic cleansing. So that was a genocide. The Rwandan genocide uh, of the Tutsis, that was a genocide. Um, if you call what happened in Germany, in Poland, in Europe, in the 1940s a genocide, you are downgrading the Holocaust. This is why I make a distinction between the Holocaust and genocide. Right? What's happening now, it is very clear. Listen to the Israeli members of cabinet. We need to get rid of them. To get rid of them, the whole, uh, the native Palestinians who had been there for 20 generations, yeah, they need to be gotten rid of and replaced by settlers from New Jersey and from Brooklyn. This is what they're doing. That is genocide. This is not just killing. It's not just, just a massacre. It is a systematic plan ethnically to cleanse and to replace one population by a settler population. That is the official definition of genocide in the United Nations and also in the Treaty of Rome that constituted the International Criminal Court. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, thank you for the <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, o o only one remark. Only one f from my side. One final remark. Um, I can I cannot accept uh, these. Uh, uh, I, I totally reject what uh, Hamas has done, uh, irrespective uh, of maybe reasons. And uh, I want to point out, without discussing it further, that Hamas does not represent the Palestinians. All right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wait, 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 wait. We'll, you'll okay. get your chance. You'll get your chance. You'll get your chance. Okay. Look, look. <clears throat> you know what? You know what? Um, you know what? I personally, I, allow me to say this. You said that Hamas does not um, represent the Palestinians. Does Netanyahu represent the Israelis? No. 
I don't think he does. I, don't, I do not recognize in Netanyahu somebody who speaks for Israelis. My Israeli comrades treat him and look at him like a war criminal. They do not want to be represented by him. No, no. What you're saying is, is that, is that what you're saying is Netanyahu is the head of a government which is recognized by Germany. That's what you're saying. That's what you say. That's the only difference, right? That's the only difference. Um, well, I have certain logical difficulties grasping the position of the German government. Because the German government claims, if you ask Olaf Scholz, Habeck, all of them, they will tell you that their official policy is a two-state solution in Palestine, right? That's what they say, since Oslo. And lots of people. I used to support the two-state solution. I don't anymore. I'd, but that's... No, it's not just unrealistic. Anyway, this doesn't matter what they believe. I'm telling you that, you know, the, if you ask the German government, the French government, the American government, Joe Biden, two-state solution, and yet they are fully supporting a man, Netanyahu, whom rec they recognize as the official head of the Israeli state, whose life work was to ensure that the two-state solution never happens. And who has violated international law day after day after day. And he has broken the Oslo Accords. And who has supported Hamas for 20 years financially. And yet this government, recognizing Netanyahu, backing him, sending idiotic Ursula von der Leyen on behalf of Germany and the Europeans to hug him in front of Israeli tanks before they invade Gaza, we are complicit in war crimes. This country is complicit in war crimes. My country is complicit in war crimes. So that is why I am refusing to accept that Hamas needs to be condemned. You know what? I'm an atheist. They would probably hang me. I don't know. But I'm not going to condemn them. Because when you have a people who have been completely, completely been refused any option. When people say to me, ah, but Hamas, you know, they don't recognize Israel. Well, does Israel recognize Palestine? No. Secondly, imagine that today there is a button here. Let's suppose, you know, there is a button here. Mental experiment, science fiction. We press it and Hamas have a conversion. You know, Allah goes to them and convinces them to lay down their arms and to recognize Israel. What's going to happen? We know what's going to happen. It's happening with West Bank because the PLO recognized Israel and laid down its arms. And what is happening? Ethnic cleansing in the West Bank. So then this is not a problem. The problem is Germany. The problem is Greece. The problem is France. We are weaponizing the Zionist brutes to carry out the genocide in Palestine, in Israel, against the interests of Israelis, against the interests of Jews. And this is why the best defenders, the best defenders of both Israel and Palestine are our Jewish comrades. People like Gideon Levy, <coughs> people like Iris Hafez, people like Ilan Pape, who are like... But, what? Yes, yes, yes. There's a long list of Jews who are at the for forefront of saving us from our complicity with the crimes against humanity perpetrated by Israeli apartheid. Well, thank you. thanks a lot for the um, yeah, very strange answer. And I think we can continue to talk about that later on. Uh, we are like running for the time. And um, I got another question for Helga. Um, uh, for almost all Europe-wide crisis, we're coming now uh, to the financial part because you know um, that all the wars, it's happened because we're pumping, pumping and pumping further on uh, lots of money and producing weapons and so on. So anyway, for almost um, Europe-wide international crisis, such as um, housing shortage, labor force um, devaluation, health standards, uh, lack of education, social insecurity, and uh, democratic blockades. 
but probably we will have to define the democracy again, but we call it now here democrat blockouts. Um, the financial markets is the basis um, and place a disease point in the world. What are your concrete proposals? What um, are your concrete proposals and what financial reforms would still be necessary? Yes, okay, not so easy to change the subject, but um, uh, f first of all, uh, we have many mini crashes, you know, Credit Suisse. We had the US regional banks, we had recently the uh, New York Community Bank, and commercial real estate of one trillion uh, is outstanding, and that's a lot, even for small banks here in Frankfurt. And uh, the, basic, the, the, the main insight should be that the financial markets are not usual markets. Uh, usually, uh, to give you one example, when prices rise, uh, the demand goes down very often, or you have substitution or you have a further increase of supply. In this case, it's opposite. You have an increase of asset prices, and then the demand goes up, and then the demand goes even further up. You can create money out of thin air, uh, and um, you have too big to fail, so the central banks intervene. And uh, the afterglow is that we have hundreds and thousands of problems we are facing now with the increasing inflation, etc., etc. Interesting story, but very bad, in fact. And we have an international uh, of globalists. Uh, the central banks belong to it as the bank of the banks. Inside job economies, uh, economists, you wrote a nice textbook. <laughs> I have it at home, by the way. Uh, mega corps, uh, credit card companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the, and the rich and wealthy. And uh, so, so what could be done? Uh, they prevent it. And we have power concentration. Uh, so, uh, for example, BlackRock, uh, the management under assets, uh, uh, the volume is higher than the German GDP, and that's that's really a lot. Um, so what what can we do? Uh, just to name <laughs> uh, three or four. Uh, first, a one-day minimum holding period. Uh, when you talk with uh, people around the corner here, they say you are crazy because we are dealing in milliseconds. And I say, well, why do you do that? Uh, to make money, uh, exactly. Uh, money for nothing. So a one-day one holding period uh, would be revolutionary, and the high-frequency trade would disappear immediately. Uh, second, as I mentioned, the gift money through central banks, so a re-empowerment uh, of the state. Uh, third, uh, a full, that's a little bit difficult to explain, a full or positive money, Vollgeld in German. Uh, this means uh, at the moment private banks uh, can create money via credit. And, and that's very bad because you, have, uh, you always have uh, credit cycles. And this can hardly be controlled by the central banks. And therefore, a national bank, a central bank, should be the only institution uh, to create money. The banks can give credits. They can do this. Uh, but only when people have saved. That makes a big uh, difference. Then, at, uh, sure, we need, uh, as for the IT companies you mentioned, uh, a deconcentration of the mega banks, 50 billion or 100 uh, should be the maximum, and uh, two more, and that, that's it. Uh, prohibitions, short selling should not be allowed. It didn't exist 30 years ago, very bad effects uh, should not be there. Credit default swaps, uh, credit Ausfallversicherung, that's also very bad. You make money when other people have problems, uh, that's bad because then you try to create their problems. Um, and uh, 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 just for insiders, repos, maturity mismatch, very bad. Uh, and finally, 30%, uh, you, you mentioned 10% in your program. Uh, I would put 20 on top and say 30% uh, uh, unbalanced equity capital. Uh, that could serve as a buffer. And uh, at the moment uh, in the EU, we have very tiny, tiny reformption, you know, little, little reforms. That's, that's not that much. And uh, uh, the, the next financial crisis is uh, uh, looming, maybe before the European uh, 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 elections. And then maybe you are in Parliament. <laughs> I won't tire you very much. Just very briefly, I want you to imagine yes, how the world would change drastically if we were to introduce two small, small-looking pieces of legislation. One, you cannot buy and sell shares to a company. You can only get one share if you work in a company like you get a library card when you go to university. You go to university, you get a library card. You can't 
sell it, you can't lease it, you can't rent it, you can't buy it. No? You can use it. You can use it to vote, to use your the computer facilities, the library. Huh? Imagine if that were the case. So corporate law says that anybody who works in the company is a part owner of the company, and that's it. And these shares are the only shares. The second piece of legislation, just science fiction, I know, but imagine. Second piece of legislation, the European Central Bank gives a digital account to each one of us, a digital wallet. It's in your app, right? You have the app from your bank. You have an app from the ECB. And you have a PIN number, and you can direct all your salary, your wages, or payments made to you in there for the ECB, right? And you can make any payments to anybody from that app for free. Think of what these two pieces of legislation do, would do to the world we live in. Firstly, no more stock exchanges. Here in Frankfurt, it will close because if you can't buy and sell shares, the stock exchange is gone. Secondly, no private banks. What's the point of the private bank if you can have a free account in the ECB and you can transfer your money for free on the ledger of the ECB? Um, the ba maybe some small banks would exist because they would come and offer you loans. But then again, if they fail because they overdo it, then you don't need to save them because everyone will have the capacity to have their savings on their ECB account and the payment system will not belong to the bankers. So suddenly you have the complete diminution of the banking sector, the banking sector, but without any, any rules and regulations, the bank, they will simply wither. Because banks today have two, they exist for two reasons. One is to lend money to stockbrokers to play gamble on the stock exchange. If you have no stock exchange, that doesn't happen anymore. And the second reason why the banks are so powerful is because they have a monopoly of the payment system. For you to pay for a coffee, you need to have a bank account. But if the CB gives you a free bank account, then you don't need to have an account with Deutsche Bank. So, eh? so these two, these two small changes, shares like library cards in a university for employees of a company, and an ECB free bank account, which can happen tomorrow, by the way. The technology is here. It can happen tomorrow. Suddenly we have socialism. <laughs> Thanks a lot, um, Helga Parker, Janis Varoufakis. We'll take a little break, um, got a little shift here, take a drink, um, yeah, walk to the toilet, and yeah, soon in a bit. So, genau. Okay, sehr schön. Da sind wir jetzt. Johanna, bitte. So, um, and now we are um, sitting here with three of our candidates for the European election and um, one member of the coordinating collective of DiEM25. I will introduce them one by one to you just in a minute. Um, starting with um, our candidate on top of the list, um, Karin Derigo. Then we have the person right after Karin on the list, um, Johannes Fair. Yeah. Also candidate for the European election and actually a local, uh, Vincent is from Frankfurt, Vincent Welch. And then, as mentioned, we have a guest from Brussels. It's Eric Edman, a strategic coordinator of DiEM25 and also speaker of Meta25 Greece. <laughs> so we wanted to have a couple of questions to each person, but um, to give you a bit more time to also ask your question to everyone and also to Janus and Helga. Uh, we will shorten this part a bit. But I want to start with you, Karin. Um, and I want to ask you a question that I feel gets frequently asked. Now, since the beginning, DiEM25 has a ra rather brutally honest analysis of the EU. That the EU is very undemocratic, subject to lobbyists, working for big businesses, 
Now, in this very sad state, why would you, why would Meta25 like to enter the European Parliament? Well, that's exactly the reason why we want to enter it, because now it's so shattered, the situation, that uh, somebody has to do something. So, um, before the pandemic, actually, we were living in a parallel world, it's, I remind it like that now, and uh, we were actually thinking that, yeah, we had some problems, but uh, we didn't have anything major to worry about, at least here in Europe. The, what, what happened in the last four years is that we, things have changed so much, so fast, that we, ha we are living such an uncertainty, and basically we have a war outside of our door. And then people start to mobilize. I didn't, fe I didn't feel the need to engage before, personally. But now that the situation is so catastrophic, I really feel the need, because in 20 years, I don't want to say, where was I at that moment? Why didn't I do anything? So. This is what we are doing now today. The European Parliament, as I learned it in the school, it was a, the temple of democracy. It was a huge, successful story for me. I looked it up uh, as it was really something nice, something to trust. Unfortunately, it turned out uh, totally different, but it has the potential to be that. It is a platform where inequality could be fought and uh, wealth could be redistributed. Just now, for so many years, uh, has been basically held hostage by all these conservatives, lobbyists, uh, who just sold literally our future to the best bidder and in key sectors like pharmaceutical, energy, uh, agriculture, and obviously defense. So now we need really to have a new class of political actors who are not focused on career and money because we need to reclaim back accountability. It's the first step if we want to build a solid future. Thank you. So, um, going over to Johannes, um, I wanna go, of course, European election is about Europe, but it's also, of course, about Germany. And I want to speak a bit about the role of Germany. Now, in the left in the 70s and 80s in Germany has always warned that Germany could become, again, a dangerous central power. Since the invasion of Russia, of, the U of Ukraine, um, it seems that Germany, not in, just in Europe, but also from the international community, gets even encouraged to become such a central power. Um, what do you believe? Where are we headed in Germany? And what does that mean for future generations, like for younger people, but also for, for example, my children? Thank you. Before I go into that, I first wanted to say that it's uh, really great to see so many people here. Um, and it has been an incredible journey. Now, the last days uh, when we have been in Berlin, Munich yesterday, protesting against the NATO conference there, and uh, joining the peace conference and now here tonight, uh, it's really, really wonderful. And uh, also to see Karin here next to me, who is just a person that I, as I joined a bigger while ago in the Berlin group of um, DM and Meta25, and I asked her last summer, what do you think about maybe applying, you know, as a candidate? And here you speak now, uh, it's really impressive. And uh, thank you for doing this. And by the way, that's also for everyone here, it's really easy to become engaged and get involved with our organization and it's fun. It's also a bit exhausting, but, uh, uh, and I, we hope it will be a hell of a ride until June. Um, speaking about Germany, I think in DiEM25, as the European movement, as it was founded in 2016, it was founded because we cannot solve anything by just changing things in one country. We cannot solve anything by changing things in Germany, in Greece, in France, in any other country. That's why DiEM25 and Meta25, the parties of DiEM, as part of this movement, 
do exactly that. We work transnationally. We had Yanis here from Greece for this uh, journey that I just described. And we have that as the core of our organization to tackle the problems of war, of genocide, of climate change, of all the problems that we have unitedly. But in Germany, we have an important role and this country has a central role in Europe. You're right that in the 70s and 80s, as I read, because I'm born in, in 87, the, the students on the street fought um, to prevent a reunification of a state that is going to be a central force for military power in Europe. And now as the government here decided, and this was a really frightening moment for me to see the speech of Olaf Scholz when he announced, and he had a list of fighter jets, tanks, and the stuff he wanted to buy to rearm this country in a way that it hasn't been armed since the Second World War for a very good reason. So we are about funding all these resources and all this labor that unfortunately is going into this at the moment, into the things that we need, into public housing, housing owned by the society, into really fighting climate change, into having a job guarantee, into having all those things that we could have if we just would not have the people in power that we have right now. And that's why we are trying this. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really happy that uh, we are here tonight and hopefully we can go much further. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Um, Vincent, um, speaking of, you know, um, Germany and shifting its focus to, you know, military spending, a hundred billions for military. Um, we all know, and we heard it also today in the first part, that there are many good ways to spend money uh, and on what is spent the best. But we have a mechanism in Germany, which is one topic that you're kind of an expert on, and you were the driving force for this campaign a year ago already, um, is to stop the debt break. This is a, a specialty of Germany, um, and it's, I think they don't even know this mechanism in many other countries. Explain to us what is the problem with the debt break, with the so-called Schwarze Null that also Christian Lindner, the finance minister, is a huge fan of. And what would change if this debt break would be abolished? Yes, yeah, so in simple terms, the debt break is a rule written in the German constitution that uh, prohibits the German government uh, in, uh, in a usual fiscal year to have a deficit that is higher than 0.35% of GDP, of national income. Uh, so uh, it puts a huge fiscal constraint, a constraint on public spending on the um, government. On, uh, it uh, inhibits its possibilities, its abilities to um, efficiently allocate money to um, important sectors and uh, social policies, economic uh, and, and climate policy. So maybe to pick up on what Jan just said and connect it to the uh, subject of debt break, um, what would uh, proponents of the debt break uh, have you believe why we need uh, a rule like this? It's simply you have to prioritize and the debt break uh, uh, purportedly uh, forces you to prioritize in spending. But actually we have it the exact uh, wrong way. Uh, you have, of course, constraints. You have limits on what you can do as a state, as a society, but um, uh, the monetary limits, the fiscal constraints, they are purely um, uh, of a legal, legal nature. They are, technically, they are not a law of nature, so the real constraints are in um, the resources that you have available, like labor, like uh, knowledge and education, like... Um, a workforce capacity and, of course, commodities. So that are the real constraints and that is the frame within we have to prioritize as a society, not um, some uh, 
completely arbitrary um, rule in your constitution uh, constraining um, your annual budget. So that's the problem with a um, debt break, that it uh, does not allow us to invest public money to spend in the sectors that we um, must spend in order to uh, tackle the um, huge challenges uh, of the present, um, which are of a transnational nature, of course, like climate change, like pandemics, um, which we saw, saw, saw in the last couple of years, um, like the challenges of globalization, and of course now the uh, uh, unwinding of globalization, uh, which, which happens. Um, there, are, um, there are huge implications in all of these questions, uh, but we have to free our mind um, of the um, premise that money is somehow um, scarce. It's um, the opposite way around. But real resources are scarce, but not money. So, of course, we have to abolish the debt break, not just in Germany, also the European fiscal rules, because uh, next year austerity is going to return to all of Europe. The um, um, EU member states and European Parliament just agreed on a revised framework for, um, it's called the Stability and Growth Pact, you know, um, which also limits the abilities of government across the, uh, Euro, the European Union and the Eurozone to um, spend money. Uh, so we, as Mayor 25, um, are, are not compromising in any way. We are not um, inventing any uh, rules like a golden rule for investment, but you can <laughs> pu publicly spend money for, for certain areas, but other, um, other areas not. No, it's, it's, it's really um, a matter of prioritization. And um, I think um, the people, the society uh, in whole should democratically decide via its elected representatives in the parliament um, where to spend and how much to spend without, without, without an artificial ceiling. So, um, yeah. thank you for the um, yeah, uh, notification. Um, so, what Johanna said um, was actually right. Um, we should not uh, invest in military equipment because that will actually then constrain um, uh, our productive ca um, capacities in other sectors, which are much more urgent right now, like the, um, like, like the energy transition um, and uh, social policy. So a way with a debt break, abolish um, that uh, stupid rule in the Constitution. Thank you very much. Um, since we have the political director of DiEM25 here, I think that people would be very much interested in, uh, in hearing also something about DiEM25 as an organization. Now, you have been in the, in the movement since almost since the beginning, Eric. And uh, I think it's fair to say that when the movement was created in 2016, until now, eight years later, the world has changed quite a lot. Um, so I want to know, like, from... From that perspective, how did the political climate change and how did it influence DiEM25 as an organization uh, and maybe even influence what, how the path of the organization was? Uh, thanks, Juliana. Hi, everyone. Um, to be honest, it hasn't changed. The world has not changed. And this is what changes everything. And I I'll explain what I mean by that. Look, when we created DiEM in 2016, we said, we said a number of things. We said Brexit in this European Union is an inevitability. We we're saying that in 2016. We said climate catastrophe is a slow motion train wreck and just waiting to happen. We said that war is around the corner because at the same time the far right is on the rise and it's on the rise because of our own political failures, us as the left, the social democrats who dominated, the uh, you know, disastrous political rhetoric of the center-right, which isn't that center-right anymore, but it's shifted to the far-right at this stage, conservatives, um, who have been presenting themselves as you know, the saviors of Europe from the fascists. So you either vote for us or you're gonna get fascism. We were talking about that in 2016. I mean, did I just describe 2024 or didn't I? When, when we say that the world's changed, no, it has not. We were on that path, and we are still on that path. If anything, we were a bit... It's terrifying how accurate we were about it. And this is what changes everything. Because the fact that when we started DiEM, basically a decade ago, 
we said that if Europe isn't democratized in the next 10 years, basically now, we're, we're in deep trouble. So the fact that we've made it to 2024 and this path has not been averted, this is what changes everything. So the fact that nothing's changed is what makes everything different. And what do I mean by that? I'm basically a kid of the Indignados movement, Occupy, Occupy the Squares, Aganaktismeni in Greece. Um, and I remember those movements from back then. I remember the energy and the passion with which we took to the streets and the incredible feats in, in a short period of time that were achieved in terms of political symbolism and how much passion was created out of those you know, movements. However, I also keenly remember, well, now with hindsight, I'm not going to pretend I knew it back then, that we were incapable of organizing for the day after. We were so stuck at organizing the movement, at making the movement relevant and powerful in that moment that we never thought about the next day. And what happens when you don't organize for power is that somebody else is organizing for you. So that power vacuum that you created, somebody else is going to eat it up. And this is what happened to us. Right? It's what happened in Greece with Syriza. They ate up that power vacuum completely undermining us. And also, and this is what really frustrates me, it's still happening in 2024. When you go to a Fridays for Future march, or you go to an Extinction Rebellion event, people that I am so proud of and I feel so deeply connected to politically, because of the radicalism, which we in many ways did not have, they're more radical, especially Fridays for Future. However, Listen to what they're saying in terms of political coherence. Politicians for decades have been betraying us. They have not been honest. They are corrupt. They're in the pockets of, of, of big uh, companies, etc., etc. So what we're going to do about it? We need to make the politicians listen to... What are you talking about? They're the ones that did it in the first place. And your solution is to talk to them and make them to see the light? It's... You know, we're still making the same mistakes. And this is what's important about Diem. Diem was created not to make that mistake, and that's why I'm still in it. Because I consider this to be such a key element that you don't stop at demonstrating. You need to take that step that you guys are taking here in Germany with Meta, that we are taking in Greece with our Meta. It's not enough to demonstrate. Because you might win a short victory, but the moment you're tired, which inevitably will happen if you're in a movement, they're going to do it all over again. Because it's the same people, and they're in the pockets of the same power structures. If you don't infiltrate those power structures, nothing's going to change. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Now, one thing, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking a bit over time. Very quickly, the one thing that has changed is war. We didn't have a war in 2016, not in the same way. And this is a new reality, which is why I think it's so important that our campaign as DiEM25 puts as number one policy non-alignment for Europe. And this is a critical shift in our position. Because until Europe is politically independent from the geopolitical interests of not only the US, who's, as Yanis very well put it yesterday, whose vassals we've essentially have become because of the inability of our politicians to stand uh, for our interests and their inability to create a European Union that is capable and efficient and effective to do the things that it needs to do. Um, we are essentially vassalized to the US and their geopolitical interests. Until that changes, until we reinvestigate our relationship with NATO, um, until we basically create our own foundation on which to stand by our own principles, we will never see a moral position on the war in Ukraine, and we will never see a moral position in Gaza. This is what needs to happen, and that is something that is different, and I'm really glad that we have all agreed, as met as, as DiEM, to make that one of our priorities. Thank you, Eric. Of course, you took two questions out of my mouth. <laughs> Uh, no, but I think it's important that, and I believe that people understood very much how the Meta 25s came to be, because you talked about that um, unwillingness of the established political landscape to change anything. So, of course, it, you come to the point where you're like, okay, let's do it yourself, you know. 
Um, but I think I want to ask, like, each of you can answer this, this question as you wish. Um, I think it's interesting for the audience to know you mentioned independence as one core topic for the European election, but what what are the points? What are the main points for the European election? Like, if you vote MANA 25 uh, in June, what are you voting for? I will try to be very brief because this is an important question. So, um, for me, our party stands for solidarity, peace and respect. This is, these are, for me, the basic values. Other than this, uh, one great quality is internationalism, which means, uh, and we have it in our DNA because we were born as a pan-European movement with DN25, we work collectively building programs, electing candidates, uh, and this is necessary because if we want to fight against big corporations, lobbyists, who are already internationalists, and they do it much better than all the other parties, then we, this is the only way we can do it. So this is one reason more, and I will leave the others to the other. Thank you. Um, I think I will, we actually already talked so much about the program and our topics uh, tonight. So I want to bring a bit what, what the fun part and the, 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 the real practice social part will be in the campaign after we make it to the signature collection. And we'll ask you later for your help also. Um, and that's going to be, and that's what also the movement part in our organization is about, to bring people together. Bring people together from different countries, from different religions, from different, also some different leftist beliefs, hopefully, that we can unite and bring together as a strong organization to bring about change. And the fun part will be, if we're going to put up our posters about peace, about the green transition paid by the rich, about uh, universal living income in the European elections, that's hopefully, and that will be my biggest joy, make some people in the banks, in the media, a little bit angry in front of their laptop. That's my personal goal for uh, our campaign that we are um, yeah, at, the mo at the moment preparing. Thank you. So it's about constructive disobedience. That's more of the theory of change here within DiEM25 since its founding already. Um, we cannot uh, credibly say that we are going to change uh, the whole of Europe uh, within a couple of days uh, after perhaps hopefully being elected to the European Parliament because uh, the uh, center of power lies, of course, elsewhere in the European Union. It lies within the uh, national states, at governments, and uh, in a lot of cases, the special interests like lobbies, like um, uh, huge companies um, and corporate uh, oligarchs that control uh, parts of the policies of this re these respective governments. So Europe is dysfunctional. So what would be a, a policy priority for me personally um, and I know it perhaps sounds a bit far-fetched, but I think you have, you've you got to have a uh, vision uh, for a um, ecologically sustainable and a socially just, progressive future of Europe, and that is a political union. I mean, think, of, think about it. We have um, a monetary union. We have a customs union. Um, we have uh, several other uh, kind of uh, legal frameworks that bind Europe together, but uh, still to this day, we do not have a fiscal union. No common taxation, no, at least uh, not uh, in a very uh, large amount, uh, common spending on the EU level. Uh, there are these things called cohesion funds in the European Union, um, which intend to um, accelerate the progress towards um, equitable social outcomes, right, to purchasing power parity in the various countries, member states of the European Union. But um, they fail in, in achieving that goal. Um, and there is no grand vision of a, a common future of Europe. So we are federalists by heart. We are, of course, European internationalists. We went in the long term, establish a united, democratic, secular 
uh, federation, a European republic. Uh, so that's one thing that was very important for me, and it, uh, going in that direction would also allow us to um, finally get serious about tackling all the very important um, global challenges that we are facing today, which we mentioned before, and um, also um, get serious about um, tackling the cost of living crisis, um, which has plagued us for the last uh, couple of years, um, which was induced by exogenous uh, shocks in the supply chain and the war in Ukraine and um, the COVID pandemic. And all these um, things are problems, crises, which, are, um, which go beyond um, one single nation state, where, where there are cross-border crises, cross-border problems, um, might implicate um, uh, all of Europe and in, in many ways also the rest of the world and disproportionately um, the global south even more. So um, we have to uh, view things from international internationalist perspective. That is the, um, I think, ideological core of Mayor 25 and Team 25. That's why we're doing this. Continue. Okay, um, thank you all. Um, now that's enough questions from me. Now it's uh, the turn of the audience to ask questions. I would like to ask Helge and Janis back on stage. <laughs> okay, um, until the chairs will be coming back and Helge and Janis, please come to the stage. My name is Alexander, I'm here from Frankfurt. Uh, so there seems to be a contradiction between social and ecological necessities and uh, this is the, the question involved. Um, so first, we're living in, in a financialized capitalist system where uh, the bankers are predatory to industrial capital and to workers' income. So uh, the primary task of the financialist, uh, financialized capitalism is, is rent-seeking and not production and is by that means deindustrialization. And uh, we have a monetary union whose primary reason of existence is to impose austerity on the people of Europe. And the process of deindustrialization is accelerated uh, by the EU and European governments imposing trade wars in China and Russia, like with a cutoff of, of the Russian gas supplies, for example. Um, so imposing the burden, uh, excuse, so, um, so we're imposing those burdens of deindustrialization on, on the population, on small businesses by means of austerity. And now Helge Poikert did say there's a necessity of degrowth, uh, degrowth of energy and material throughput to the uh, economy to prevent the imminent uh, ecological collapse and with it the, the possible collapse of organized human society. Uh, so how do we get to a point of ecological sustainability without putting the burden of the deindustrialization on the poor of Europe? You are as well. Um, if we abolish private cars and we increase uh, um, public mobility, then people can save a, a lot, a lot of money. And um, poorer people uh, usually live uh, near the highways, for example, and there it's very noisy, uh, they get ill uh, uh, more quickly, etc., etc. So this deindustrialization uh, can be very helpful. And uh, it should not, not primarily be done via uh, 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 pri the price mechanism, so to increase the prices for flights, etc. Because then poorer people are disadvantaged and uh, uh, the richer people can say, well, that's wonderful, this policy, uh, because, uh, because now we get rid of the multitude uh, uh, on the highway and in the airplanes. So that's not the way we should do it.
we need three things. By the way, your question was not just a question. It was a statement, you know, a, a mini program, and I agree with you, right? But I'll just add to your program. Three things. First, and I think you alluded to it before, uh, money is not the problem. DiEM25, we stood in the European Parliament election 2019, five years ago, with a very clear solution to the question of where does the money come for the green fund by which to pay for the green transition. And the, the solution we had was, which is, by the way, utterly consistent with both the European Union treaties and with German law and what the Constitutional Court would say, was really very simple. The European Investment Bank, which is owned by all your EU countries, should issue, we said back then, half a trillion worth of bonds every year. And in the press conference that that would be announced, the head of the central bank would be sitting next to Werner Hoyer, who was then the, uh, the head of the AIB, and the head of the central bank would announce that if need be, if need be, the ECB would buy those bonds in the secondary markets to make sure that the interest rates were very close to zero. Then we would have had, if that had happened, we would have had two and a half trillion euros being spent on green on a green transition without taxation. So that's just one thing of one kind of thing we need to do. The second thing we need to do is we need to destroy electricity markets. End them. They can be there is no need to have electricity markets. We don't have electricity markets. We have a cartel of electricity that is owned by private companies that create, have huge profit margins and which always go for the fuel and the means of production electricity that maximizes their ends, not the ones that are in the interest of society and of nature. Uh, there is one wire coming out of the wall in your home. There is, that's not a market. That's a monopoly, right? Then you have a the Thatcherite model that started in Britain under Thatcher of creating a so-called auction market, but that is not a market. If you have an auction of five people or five companies, that's a cartel. So like that's like we you know we handed over our electricity to a cartel. We need to end that cartel and we need to decentralize production and uh, distribution and exploitation of electricity along the lines of um, neighborhood owned networks connected with one another, public ownership, but owned by the local communities. And the third thing we need, and I, that's where we agree, we need limits to physical growth. To physical growth. We need to say that, you know what? Forget the emissions trading schemes and all that quasi-neoliberal idiotic market idea. It doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. So this is, you know, the maximum amount of um, pollution is going to be this. The maximum amount of cement we're going to be using in society will be this. We're not going to use more. We do what we can do with this amount of cement. So f limits to physical growth, not limits to development. Okay, and that, and, 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 and more generally, I think it is essential uh, to overthrow, to do away with an assumption which is in the mind of people out there. The assumption that going green is a sacrifice. That we need to sacrifice our well-being to go green. Huh? We have to change the context. To have prosperity, we need to go green. Very briefly, to add to Yanis, uh, everything of which I obviously agree with, um, I think politically, there is also one more thing that needs to be done, and that is that we need to end a mass delusion that we have in society right now. And that is the delusion that the green movement, the green transition, all the policies that are necessary are being represented by the Green Party. That is a joke, especially in this country. There is... Sorry, there is no party that has done more to undermine the Green Movement than the Green Party of Germany. 
It is horrendous what has been done at a time when finally society is realizing that we can't do without the green transition and the people to whom we entrusted this huge project to was the Green Party that is already in the pocket of bloody Volkswagen. It's a joke. We need to reclaim green politics for real progressives, not the Green Party. Um, I, will, I will take the liberty to, and I ask the moderation if that's okay, to also um, introduce someone that I'm very happy that's in the, in the audience tonight, which is Wieland Hoban from the Jewish Voice, Jüdische uh, Stimme für gerechten Frieden in Aus. To say for a few words, thank you very much for coming. And this is completely on me. Apologies for taking one question time away. Thanks, Johannes. Um, it was nice to hear Janis mention uh, Iris Hefferts earlier. She's one of my closest comrades in our organization. And of course, she went viral with her little one-woman protest. Um, and it highlighted the absurdity, of course, of the general German response to the issue of Palestine and the way that it uh, soils this issue with that of, of anti-Semitism. And of course, you spoke of Gaza earlier, and we really need to talk about Gaza, and I don't just mean here, where many of us agree on that subject, but everywhere. And I don't just mean on the street either. Of course, in the movement, we're all hitting the streets every week. But I also mean speaking about it to people around us, you know, maybe a friend, maybe a colleague. In many situations, it can be dangerous to do this. People have lost their jobs. People have been stigmatized in culture, in academia, in politics. So a lot of people are very careful about opening their mouths. But where it's possible, we have to do it because the consensus that it's somehow acceptable to stifle this position, which is really just a position of human rights and basic morality, this consensus has to be destroyed. And it can't be destroyed just by demonstrating, and it can't be destroyed just by lobbying politicians. It has to be destroyed through society, because apparently 61% of Germans do not agree with what's happening in Gaza, so the polls claimed. But many of those are not going to say it because they don't want to be called anti-Semitic. They want, they want to believe that the correct response to the Holocaust is not to say it. And we have to convince them that actually the only response to the Holocaust is to say it. Because if you are against genocide, then you are against all genocide. And the Nazi Holocaust was one genocide and this is another. And with all the differences between every genocide, we cannot say that we have learned from that and that we stand for some kind of motto of never again if we are accepting this. And Germany in particular committed two genocides in the 20th century, in Namibia and in the Holocaust. And now, <laughs> and now we see it not only defending politically the genocide in Gaza, but also saying that it will support Israel in court, that it will be an active legal defender of genocide, and of course the whole time it is arming Israel. Since, since last year, arms sales have increased tenfold to Israel. This is more than acceptance, this is complicity. Germany should be in The Hague as well. And so we have to make this clear. <laughs> That there is no, that we will not accept any different standard of morals and human rights within Germany because of what Germany has done before. On the contrary, if anything, Germans should feel more obliged than anyone else to make sure that there is really never again for anyone. Who's next? At the back. Yeah. Very, very good yes, idea. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Here's a woman, there's a woman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wants to ask something. I'm not allowed to run in front of the camera, though. So. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my question is to Yanis. Um, my name is Arwa. I was originally, um, I was born and brought up in London, and I've been living and working in Germany for the last 25 years now. Um, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to Yanis, who I've only actually just in the last year become aware of, um, for speaking out so fearlessly and unapologetically about these issues that so many people care about, but which very few people in the public domain have the spine to say so clearly. So first of all, thank you, not just from me, but a lot of people I talk to, friends, colleagues. Um, that's the first thing. The, my question I would actually like to ask is about media. And you had briefly referred to, you made a comment which I thought was very uh, significant about these algorithms that are controlled so that people uh, turn people against each other in social media discourse and, and so on. And I think who controls the media has so much power. And we see today we don't really have free media. And I mean, I, I could listen to media in several languages, but not everybody can do that. And I, even if I just compare how, for example, the BBC reporting on the Palestine-Israel crisis and how German state media is reporting on the BBC, uh, on the Palestine-Israel crisis, there's a big difference. And it makes it very difficult when I have uh, conversations with my German friends and colleagues who are actually not getting the full picture and are only seeing, you know, that what can we do about that? This is a real challenge because people can only make decisions based on the information that they have. And not everybody is bilingual or multilingual. And um, I think these wars that we've had, also Ukraine, uh, has also shown how critical things that are happening are not really being reported. I mean, for example, um, Boris Johnson, when uh, Zelensky was ready to sign the peace deal and Boris Johnson went to uh, uh, Ukraine to stop Zelensky from signing the peace agreement, yes, we who are thinking and reading and knowing know that there is a vested interest, the US have vested interest in this war continuing and uh, that peace is not in the interest uh, of the United States, and so on and so on. But these are quite complex, multi-layered things that not everybody is able to see through. And so uh, what, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm just putting it out there as a question, but uh, what can one do long term to, uh, you know, to sort of put media back in the hands of more people? We saw it in the, U in the UK back in the 80s and 90s, the Rupert Murdoch's uh, you know, conglomerate and so on. I think it's a big issue. I'd like yeah. to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Rupert Murdoch is still with us, determining the agenda. He hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> um, look, there is the mainstream media, and then there is social media. Mainstream media are biased and they produce fake news long before Donald Trump came around in two ways. One is actively. Actively. You mentioned Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch decides to assassinate the character of politicians, of civil society figures that are against his interests. So he goes out of his way, of his way to destroy them. Okay? And there are journalists who are paid hired guns doing that. But that's not the worst part. The worst kind of um, media tyranny is a system where no one really is responsible. It's almost spontaneous. I experienced that when I was minister and I was coming here to Frankfurt and I was going to Brussels and to Berlin and so on. The system I noticed, I, I, this is my personal experience of it, what was happening was this. Take Brussels, or Berlin, doesn't matter, but Brussels is a good example because, you know, there are 10,000 journalists and each one of them has a boss back home who wants this journalist to produce something new. And, of course, it's impossible to produce something new because there are 10,000 journalists that are competing with one another on what to write. So each one of those journalists is dying to get 
the telephone number of some person inside the buildings of the European Union, similar in Berlin with the federal government or in Paris with the French government, to have a contact that maybe will give them an exclusive. So they work their, you know, their asses off to cultivate this connection. Eh? And they cultivate it, the good ones. How many good ones are there? I mean, successful ones, after the 10,000, there are 100. And out of the 100, there are 10 who really have access to Ursula von der Leyen or to, you know, back in my day, um, Juncker, whoever happened to be at the head of the commission, right? And once they get this, they have their personal telephone number, they can text them. They, that is gold to them, that direct access, right? So, what happens is this. If you are in a position of power, like I was, not that I was in position of power, but I was engaged with people who were, we would be in meetings in the Eurogroup, and when they wanted to create fake news about what I had said or what they had said to me, all they had to do is send a text message to one of those journalists. That journalist immediately, immediately sent it to their folks back home, to the Le Monde, to, you know, Le Soir, to Frankfurter Allgemeine, right? And, and that would be published as insider information. Right, and they wouldn't care whether it was true or not. So, so and, and then what would happen is that the rest of the other ten thousand would immediately reproduce it, and before you knew it, that was what was you know that fake leak was a fact. It was impossible to go against it. You know, everybody considered it to be the truth. How can you possibly deny the truth? And then if you, in me, in that, that case, me issued a statement contradicting it, ah, he's denying it, which means it's true. Okay, so that's the mainstream media. So you've got the Rupert Murdoch's representing big capitalist interests, and you have the politicians that have 10,000 journalists who have no brains, no analysis, no interest in having brains or analysis, reproducing the fake news or whatever it is that you, they want you to know as the truth. Okay? But then you have social media, and social media in the beginning was a great hope that we would be able, each one of us would have a voice, and it would be a kind of democratic public square where there would be a contest of ideas, and the best ideas and the most true ideas would prevail. For a little while it happened. It even occasioned the Arab Spring, until that the, the Arab Spring was crucial because it toppled governments. And immediately the regimes around the world, you know, dictatorial regimes, democratic regimes, understood the power of the social media and then took them over. And it's very easy to take them over. Uh, in a country like Greece, for instance, we experienced that as Mera 25. You know, what, how much money did we, we had a budget of 20,000, 30,000 to spend on social media for the whole election campaign. The, op the government party had 10 million. If you have 10 million, you buy the whole of YouTube. The whole of YouTube. It's not that you can't put your things up on YouTube, you can. But if you, even if you spend all the 40,000 we had, in terms of the algorithms pushing for the videos we put out, it will never push it out when it's already been paid 3 million by the opposition, by the government, right? So you have the poisoning of the social media. So that doesn't mean we should stop using the social media, but what it does mean is we need to develop and to help independent electronic media. I wish we had independent newspapers, paper papers, but this is just too expensive. But there are independent media and we should support them. And we should work collectively in order to subvert the algorithms so that the algorithms push for these independent media. The British are very good. British progressive independent media like Novara, like Double Down News and so on, are doing an immensely good job. We have to emulate them. There are a few of those here in, in, in Germany. They're not as strong. You need to support them.
So uh, we have run a bit over time. So to have as many questions as possible, please try to be fast. <laughs> okay. So hello, everyone. My name is Vladimir, not as Putin, but as Lenin, as Yanis told me. Uh, anyway, uh, what are you? What you are currently doing is essentially preaching to a choir, right? I paid five euro to be there. I would never pay five euro to attend a meeting of like AFD or SPD or any other party in general. But in order to like win win the elections, you have to like convince the average Joe, the like Frau Müller, to vote for you. But the problem as I see it is um, like the general trend in the European politics is that Frau Müller tends to vote for AFD and uh, to switch to vote into AFD. Like this is the party that's gaining popularity. And that's the signal I tend to recognize as. I don't know what to do with my life, but I'm also very scared. So I'm going to like put my hand but put my hand into the sand and like outsource the crisis somehow. So the question is, uh, like, Frau Müller doesn't want to listen about like Germany being completed into genocides in the second century, so in this 20th century. Uh, do you actually have anything to say to like the general Frau Müller that's going to like make her uh, aha? So I'm not going to vote for AFD or whatever party in the European election. I'm going to vote for these guys. Thank you. Sorry, it was long in the end. Thank you. Who wants to answer how Frau Müller can be convinced? <laughs> uh, I have met Frau Müller on the street because, as, as I said before, we are signature co collecting at the moment, and it's really you being on the street talking to a lot of strangers and um, of course we do it in spaces like university where people are more open to us but we also do it in on the streets really and Frau Müller can come along and my experience is that of course a lot of people shut up, um, I'm not involved in politics or I'm not interested, I don't have time and so on, that happens but to, in my experience there is so many people out there that have a positive reaction and that are so fed up, like you are. You paid five euros to be here. Thank you. Um, so there is this potential. The question will just be how we reach these people. And um, this is going to have to do with social media. It's going to do with us putting posters on the streets. And this is going to have to do to collect a bit of money. We will not have that much, so we cannot rely on that but to have as much people as we can on the ground. This will be the key from my point of view. Um, if I can add one small thing, I uh, studied in marketing that the word of mouth is the most powerful tool there is in marketing. You can spend so much money you want, but nobody will convince you as much as your friend or your relative. So, it's very important that all of you who really believe in us uh, and in our ideas uh, go out and speak to the other people because this is the base of change, basically. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good, like, if you guys are a choir, then sing, you know? Uh, it's incredibly important. It's very powerful. And don't take it for granted that just because people pay to be here, they agree. Um, I would be very surprised if, because today you were 200, uh, which is a substantial number for a political event far away from elections. Telling, speaking from experience now, right? So don't take this for granted. This is substantial what happened here today and keep it with you and let's use it. That's one thing. Now, I'll just say one, two things. One is if we uh, don't get elected because we spoke about genocide, then I think I speak on behalf of all of us that we'd rather not get elected. Okay, we, we will speak about genocide because that is what is happening. And in general, that is one of the powerful things I think about our political project, let's call it, whether it's the movement or the party. If we wanted positions of power, including this guy, especially this guy, he could have found a much easier way than this one. Okay. You don't get to power in Germany by speaking in favor of Palestine. 
right? <laughs> there are a lot of things that we've done wrong if what we cared about was power. What we do care about is that if we do manage to get to power, we haven't sacrificed so much of ourselves to get there that we are impotent once we got there. <laughs> Which is essentially what has been happening in politics for the past decades. So even if Frau Muller disagrees with us, or rather might not agree with everything, she has an opportunity to vote for a party that won't just go to Brussels and become one with the establishment. Because if that's what we wanted, there were a million other ways for us to do it. Not this one. This is the hard way. We're going there because we want to make trouble. And I think Frau Muller agrees with that, at least. There we have a... Uh, it's... Ah, yeah. Okay, I will ask the question. Okay, we have a collective question here. Hello, I'm Lucia. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, two things that have caught our attention. Uh, it was said that we need more education and that research innovation should be reinforced. Um, I speak from the, we speak from the perspective of, neuro, of a neuroscientist engaged in basic research. So in academia, the race for money and the intrusion by capitalism have done two things. Uh, first, it has taken the fun out of it, which is awful. And two, it created an individualistic success story around academic um, uh, success and innovation. I know democracy in science is needed, but we're struggling to imagine this. Uh, so how would a democratic academic system would look like, in your opinion? Thank you. Geht es um die Drittmitteldiskussion? Okay. Uh, the discussion is, uh, wie soll eigentlich uh, die Weitung der Universität uns mit akademischer Ablauf vorstellen? Yes, sure, sure. Re sure, the, the universities are undercapitalized and, um, and therefore most scientists, unfortunately, they are very opportunist, uh, very unfortunate. Uh, they, they try to get uh, uh, third funding, and uh, so, so they are dependent uh, uh, on, on this money, even for their uh, uh, success uh, at university. Uh, when you try to be, to be hired, and I'm one of the great exceptions in Germany, it's a very close system, and you need uh, uh, almost like a lottery uh, win, <laughs> a little bit less, uh, to not, not to, to be... Uh, um, thrown out of the system. Um, so there is a very high degree of um, uh, bad con consensus. And uh, when, when you apply for such a, a, a project funded by third parties, uh, um, you, always, you already have limited uh, uh, the question you want to research. Uh, because uh, how to transcend capitalism will not be funded by pharmaceutical companies uh, or by, by governmental agencies. And this dependence is really a, a, a real problem. And also the, the professors, uh, uh, not only in Germany, uh, they are very, very mainstream, I have to say. And w when people are hired, uh, these professors decide uh, if they want uh, uh, to, um, to hire uh, a person uh, with a different opinion. Usually they don't do it. So when you ask five frogs if a red frog would like to jump uh, 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 into the water, uh, they would prefer a frog of their own color, you know. And in so far, you have a very, very bad uh, selection mechanism here. And that's why I uh, once proposed, <laughs> and people said, yeah, how can you do this, you know, the people who have been hired, uh, that we should uh, uh, introduce um, um, an arbitrary uh, 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 mechanism uh, um, that that uh, when, when, when 10 or 20 people apply, uh, you throw the dice and then you see. Uh, so, so they must be competent and, and, and so you have the... Uh, um, it's comparable to a mutation in nature, you know. Without uh, mutations, uh, we wouldn't be here. And, 
And, and so we need uh, mutations in the sense that people can apply and, and then maybe the faculty is against this person, uh, but then, uh, for example, Yanis or I, uh, we show up and say, hello, friends, you have to deal with us. Um, so, so that's a, re a real problem. Uh, there must, must be a different funding. And also the private universities uh, have a strong influence. Not only that they get state money, like Witten Herdecke, 50%, we are free university, blah, 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 you know. Uh, uh, it's for the corporates, more or less. And 50% is paid by the state. They also in influence the hiring process at the uh, uh, public universities because uh, uh, they push up uh, their, their folks uh, and, and then they will be, will be hired uh, uh, at, at the uh, uh, public universities. And one last point. Uh, to, um, to be able uh, to get third-party funding, uh, it's always an advantage when you, when you uh, apply, when you have worked before for a private company. And then the argument is, well, this is an expert. He or she knows uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the respective field from inside. So it's, it's a scientist, he knows the theory, or she knows the theory and the practice, and that's wonderful. So these are two points instead of one. And then you get the people uh, who have been socialized in the private companies. Sorry, long answer. Uh, allow me to add just one thing uh, to uh, the subject. I think what we also have to talk about in the context of um, academic research is um, intellectual property. So um, you um, have a situation um, where much of um, the um, knowledge which is gained from basic research funded by the state, funded by public institutions, is then um, kind of commodified and privatized for profit, right? Exactly. For example, the um, uh, big pharma companies um, who uh, developed the um, vaccines, um, but also um, when we uh, talk about um, uh, digital digital innovation and so on, um, I think we have to uh, uh, stick to a very clear formula, which is simply uh, public funding for public research for the public domain. No privatization, no profit of public research. Uh, thank you very much for all of this. Uh, my name is Allah, and uh, I would like to discuss all the topics, <laughs> but I'll try to uh, bring you back to the topic of the uh, European Union, and I think that was the major point of the event tonight. Uh, I didn't get it correctly. Sorry if I may put it this way, at the end of two hours and a half or three hours discussion. So what's your aim in the European Union? I heard infiltrate the structure. I heard deepening the European integration into a federal state, fiscal program, social integration, social standards. And uh, if that's not happening, because the structure from the very first beginning of the European community has been based on the interests of the economy, of the iron and coal industries, as we could know, and has developed within all these agreements into uh, a kind of economic political structure that's serving the big companies, the lobbyists, a kind of hegemonial project uh, within the globe, uh, would be the solution to re-establish something new, a possibility, for example? Would you consider that? Uh, Germany to go out, Greece to go out, Italy to go out, multiple Brexits, and to build something new? Do we have to stack to the structures what we are having, who's serving somebody else? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your question. Allow me to speak to you from the bottom of my heart. We've changed our minds. Because when reality changes, you have to change your views. If you were asking that question 
five years ago, before the European Parliament election of 2019, we would have, we would have all come out with a very optimistic, very specific and very practical answer. Uh, we would say, yes, we are in the business of democratizing the European Union, of creating the political and solidarity union that we don't have. Uh, we had a 150 page, 150 page program, which we called the Green New Deal for Europe, which included things we discussed already, you know, the European Investment Bank, issuing the bonds, the European Central Bank. We had policies about how to fund the basic income. We had policies about the banking sector, 25 pages on financial sector reforms, on citizens' assemblies to start creating the circumstances, the dynamic for writing a, a proper democratic federal federalist uh, constitution that by which to replace all these bloody treaties, um, especially the Treaty of Lisbon, which is like this it's a brick that was designed to kill the soul of any human being. Um, we had these aspirations. And then, of course, we, we, we got about one and a half million votes across Europe, which is not insignificant, but certainly not a victory, right? We didn't elect a single MEP. We came very close to one. One was stolen from us in Greece um, through electoral fraud, but that's another match, just one. Since then, every single idea we had was taken up by the European Union to be destroyed. So the idea of a common fund with bonds that will be issued collectively, we were proposing the European Investment Bank. Huh? That was the recovery fund, the next generation EU. But it was done in exactly the wrong way. Instead of being the beginning of an aggregate investment program, this was during the pandemic, if you recall, it was created as an oligarchic project, a project for creating common debt for the wrong reasons. Common debt so that the European Commission would then give the money as a result of a deal between corrupt politicians to the oligarchs of Greece, to the oligarchs of Italy. So the German proletariat was paying for the Greek oligarchs, to put it briefly. Yeah, that was what the Euro next year, that's what, what, that's what the recovery fund was. So they took some basic elements of our ideas and applied them in a way that effectively I don't want them to be implemented. I don't want, I, I, you know, the world was a better place before they were implemented. So they've just, yeah, we were talking about money printing for good social and green purposes for the, the European Central Bank. Well, the European Central Bank printed trillions and they gave it to the financiers, and now we have inflation because of the way in which the printing presses of the European Central Bank was misappropriated. The idea of a constitutional assembly eh, was effectively violated by Emmanuel Macron, who used it in the town hall meetings very cleverly in order to end the Gilets Jaunes protests. So everything we proposed, uh, we, we had pr uh, promoted and, uh, and proposed was infected, it was poisoned, and was turned against Europeans. And then the war in Ukraine begins, and effectively the European Union becomes a vassal of NATO. Cease to exist. Now it's Stoltenberg and Biden that decide everything. And Ursula von der Leyen, who really wanted to be the head of NATO, but she was not allowed to be because she's not particularly smart. So, yeah, and here we, here we are. Now, in 2019, I didn't mind having a flag of Diem next to a flag of the European Union. Now, if I see a flag of the European Union, I am going to throw up. And I'm not going to wave it, believe you me. That doesn't mean that we are proposing exit. We saw that Brexit was a great gift to the fascists because any attempt to start a campaign to get out of the European Union will, in the end, even if it's done for good left-wing reasons, is going to result in the strengthening of the xenophobes and the racists and the fascists. So we're not going to do that.
What we're doing instead is asking for your help to go in there to clash with the establishment within the establishment's institutions and to use that podium of the European Parliament in order to put out there the things you and I and us are discussing in here. It's really very modest. Um, so, but you want to add something? Okay, tiny, tiny, tiny. Okay, tiny. I promise, That's I promise. It's very closely connected to what Yanni said. And I, I need to speak to this because I have had the dubious pleasure of having lived in Brussels for a decade. Actually, it's not a pleasure, it's, it's, it's been a, a horrific decade. And anybody who tells you that they want to get elected to go to Brussels to do however that sentence ends is lying to you. Because they cannot. The European Parliament is designed to disarm you. You can't do anything in the European Parliament. That's not where the power is. So, we are not going to give you that lie. It's a mistake to say that to people. The fact that people are disappointed, disillusioned, angry with the European Union is because people have been telling them that lie for decades now. And then whatever they've promised, they have been unable to give because of how Brussels is structured. So that is, I think, the power of what Yanni said. We're not going to tell you that lie. We're going to go to Brussels because Brexit, which Yanis mentioned, was, where was Brexit created? In Brussels. It was Nigel Farage from the European Parliament. The power that the European Parliament has, and this is the only power it has, is to give you, if you use it well, a platform. It's a microphone. It is powerful if you use it smart, if you don't spend all your time running around in circles in tiny little subcommittees that achieve nothing. That is the power of the European Parliament. That's how we were going to use it in order to create a pan-European movement that can turn to the European Parliament into what it needs to be. That is the aim, that is Meta, that's what we're offering. Uh, thank you, Eric. I'm actually glad that you added this. <laughs> Um, we ran really, really over time. Um, if you have still questions, you can just walk towards us and ask them. Um, I think before I give now the last word to our Spitzenkandidatin Karin Derigo, I want to thank you all for being here. I hope it was an inspiring evening for you. And now, please, Karin. Yes, uh, in the name of the whole team of Mera25, uh, we really thank you for being here tonight, uh, for sharing uh, this Sunday evening. And it, this means that we are all together in this fight, uh, that we want to change things. And uh, for this, I really encourage you to go on and to help us further also. On your seats, you have a, a form that you can uh, sign to support us, to send us in the parliament uh, in Europe, uh, as Eric said, uh, to try to make a big mess. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.